When you decide to go on a long train trip and spend an extended period of time visiting your progeny, you need to pack quite a few things. Socks, extra underwear, a toothbrush, some cash, several backup kimonos. And while water is always a safe choice of beverage to bring along, you might want to treat yourself while on said trip. So cold water, yes, good, but also how about hot coffee? Yes, our sponsor continues to be Sparkplug Coffee. And while they can't serve our listeners in Japan, they do offer their stuff to Canadians and Americans. People in those two countries will get their orders on their front porch within a week, and Canadians will even get free shipping. They've got the very freshest beans you'll find in Canada, which are also fairly traded and premium Arabica beanies. Sparkplug has many blends and roasts, including rotating seasonal blends. They've got decaf and half-calf too, in case a clash with your kids is making you tense enough that you don't need a bunch of caffeine in your system to work you up even more, because these people are so worked up. But trust me, you're not going to want to order only once, so we implore you to consider a membership. That gets you perks and deals and allows you to save money on every order. You can even customize your membership to get your coffee when it suits you, and you can cancel any time. So don't think of this as a common coffee of the month club. Be sure. Go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S, and you will save 20% off your next order. That H-Y-E-S promo code for Have You Ever Seen is the key to doing that. Plus, that gesture throws a little yen our way. All right, it's time to get this conversation started, so I'm going to ask Andrew Luther to warm up his keyboard and play us in. And action! Have you ever seen... Tokyo Story. Konnichiwa, ladies and gentlemen, and arigato for being part of the audience for this 510th edition of Have You Ever Seen? We review classic movies every Monday morning, and we spoil them up, down, and all around. I'm the writer of Scintillating Dialogue, who doesn't often wave a fan in his face to cool off, partly because a teacher in school told me that the waving motion gets your heart rate up high enough that it counteracts the cool-down process you're going for. Ryan Ellis. Useless trivia for you. Maybe that teacher was wrong, but I remember hearing that a long time ago, especially the ones when they go... <laughs> well, you're just making yourself get all worked up anyway. And here's the polite lady who accompanies me on long trips and who, unlike anyone the family portrayed in Tokyo Story, loves a good hug. My wife, Bev. That's me. There's no hugging in this movie. It's a Seinfeld thing. No tears, no hugging, no learning. There's tears. There's tears. Okay, there's tears. That was a Seinfeld thing. No tears, no hugging, no learning. <laughs> I don't think they learn that much in this either. And we'll apologize here at the start if we mispronounce people's names. Whenever we cover a film made in another part of the world, the odds are good we'll botch some names, but we boring old white Canadians will do our best. So the coming attractions trivia. Well, here's a name right here I think I know how to say. Yasuhiro Ozu is considered one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. It's not Ozu, it's something else. I'm sure somebody's thinking right <laughs> I now. I think it's Yasujiro. I think you pronounce the J as well. Oh, what do you know? <laughs> right away I messed it up. <laughs> Don't listen to me, though. I'll probably say Yasuhiro. I'm sure I just heard that in an interview somewhere, and I thought, oh, that's how you say it, but that doesn't mean they were right either. Okay, so Ozu is one of the greatest of all time. He only lived to be 60 years old, though. As it relates to himself... What was particularly noteworthy about the day he died? I just didn't come across it in my research. I don't know. He died on his birthday. Oh. I don't know if that's terribly sad or beautifully poetic. It's kind of neat, isn't it? I it's mean, what's, fitting for this filmmaker. What's sad is that he died at 60. Mm -hmm. And by all accounts, his later work was excellent. He probably had more great movies in him that he just never got a chance to make. Some of the guys that worship him like Scorsese are in their 80s now. So if Ozu could be like that and be that productive at that age, and Marty's not slowing down by the looks of it. Some of his best films have been made in the last decade as well. Mm -hmm. And no, I'm not talking about the Irishman. The third member of the team, Sam, didn't join us until we started doing this. So if you hear any... <laughs> <laughs> it's him licking his diaper. <laughs> yes, he wears a diaper. He's an old man. Okay, the family that hates each other but does it politely was released in Japan 70 years ago on November 3rd, 1953. Although it didn't start being released around the world for quite a while, it took five years to get to England and didn't come to North American theaters for nearly 20. But, Bab, the movie is 70 years old in Japan, at least, so please give us the skinny on and tell us what Tokyo Story is all about. Oh, you know, an older couple go visit their adult children in Tokyo, and it's nice, but, you know, kids are busy with work and their own kids. It's a little disappointing. They may love their parents, but it's kind of hard to make space for them and time, too, but they make the best of it, and... Then on the way home, the wife gets sick, and she dies at home shortly after. So the family all comes to them for the funeral. Then everyone just carries on. Or, in a nutshell, old people, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> oh or, young people, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> this is my nutshell, totally fits with yours. You'll be sorry when I'm dead! <laughs> <laughs> 
Also, hell is other people. Maybe it comes up here. Family people. They're very polite about it. They like each other outwardly, but I don't think they like each other very much otherwise. I guess that's part of the whole point, isn't it? Okay, well, there are some very impressive numbers on Tokyo Story, and that's the reason we're doing it. Although we've never done Ozu before, and he certainly deserved to be covered at least once. The Rotten Tomatoes critics, 100% of them like the film. There are 50 reviews on the site, so it's a pretty good sample. The average is 9.6 out of 10, and 93% of audiences. Wow. It's 208th on IMDb's 250, but here we go. The Sight and Sound polls, 1992 to 2022. It was on all four of those. It was third in 92. It was fifth in 2002. It was third in 2012, and it was fourth in 2022. What a consistent performance that's been. The director's poll, it was number one in 2012, but dropped to fourth in 2022. But still, all those times on both the polls, and at least the top five, and usually in the top four, and at least once being number one. The director's poll is the one that confuses me a little bit because other directors like Scorsese are nothing like this guy. Spielberg is nothing like this guy. Altman wasn't anything like this guy. I could keep naming names. Even a fellow Japanese director, Kurosawa wasn't anything like Ozu. But maybe the other directors admire Ozu's style of just being himself. They don't share that style, but maybe they respect the hell out of the fact that he did the same basic thing in a lot of movies. This movie has a lot of things in common with Late Spring, which I only watched recently because that was on the most recent Sight and Sound list. It was on YouTube and I saw it that way. And I recommend it, by the way. But he's got a few films on that list. And here you got Tokyo Story with that kind of cred. But one more credit didn't have at the time. No Oscar nominations. Of course, that would have been many years later because the American audiences didn't see it for about 20 years. But Ozu himself was never nominated for an Oscar. A lot of the great foreign directors weren't nominated for Oscars personally. Well, not that many, but their movies often were. And maybe his movies were. I didn't look through everything, but he never was, personally. Anyway, I know you saw this back in 2012 or 13 when it made the list of number one for the director's poll on the Sight and Sound. And I saw it probably around the same time. I think you saw it before I did, though. One of the I cases did, that's where you right. saw it maybe before me. It's rare. I have to savor that when it happens because it's pretty unusual. So what would you think of Tokyo Story this time? It's a really challenging movie, but the payoff is special and unique. It floors me. It's quietly getting to the bottom of this unnamed tragic outcome of life that we all ignore because we have no choice. I'm really making this film sound like a total chore right now, and for some people it might be, but I also found it gripping and illuminating, really reflecting back something about the human condition that art in general struggles to express. I think it is so beautiful and special and brutally honest about family dynamics. I suspect there's a lot of stuff in this movie that's totally lost on me that just goes right over my head because, Mm -hmm. well, you talk about how Americans didn't see it till the 70s because they wouldn't bother releasing it outside of Japan because they considered it just too Japanese and they thought that culturally it wouldn't translate. And I'm sure that there's lots of cultural references in this film that I do not understand, especially when well, when you're talking about Japan specifically, but when you're talking about Japan post-war, mm-hmm. all these things I have no point of reference for. I visited Japan in 2005, but that was a very lost-in-translation Japan. That was... The Japan of their great-grandchildren also probably would struggle to understand the lives of these families. And that's 60 years after the war and the bomb being dropped versus this being five or six years after the war and the bomb being dropped. Or the bombs. It still feels like it's very post-war. The war isn't that far away, but it's far enough away that everybody has very much moved on with their lives and is carrying on in the future. And there's the divide between generations that mom and dad spend most of their life in pre-war Japan. And they lived near Hiroshima. Yeah. (laughs) So they saw devastation. They probably experienced a kind of existential dread that their children, if they didn't live there at the time, couldn't really understand. Well, also their parents may have been exposed to radiation. They probably were. Well, it's your theory that when the mom gets sick, it's cancer. Although I push back on that because... The way she gets sick feels pretty sudden. The fact that she's up and about and moving around and living life right up to the point that she collapses and falls into a coma. Also, the fact that they keep calling her fat. (laughs) When you get sick with just about any kind of cancer, it makes you lose a tremendous amount of weight. I think she did lose a lot of weight, they said, though, too. But they're still calling her fat. I thought so. Oh. But they're still calling her fat now because compared to everybody else, she's still not. But I guess compared to them, she somewhat is. I'd assume because of the nature of her sickness that it was a stroke or something. But she can't be that old because her youngest daughter is in her early 20s. Mm-hmm. She can't be in her 70s yet. She's got to be at the oldest in her 60s. She's unhealthy for any number of reasons. You can't really say. My problem with this movie, and not really a problem, but the reason why I don't love this movie the way others do, and of course the reason why it's on a sight and sound poll is because people submit their 10 favorite movies. 
So it could be that everyone liked Citizen Kane, Tokyo Story, Vertigo. They've all ranked really high. And every single person voted for that. It wouldn't be any higher than it already was. It'd be one, two, three, four, whatever. But when they show the results of the numbers, you'd see, I don't know, a thousand people voted for it. One of the reasons why there's so many movies that change on the thing is because people submit a top ten. Obviously, a lot of people voted for this to have it in the top five all the time. I don't really fully get that. The movie is good, without a doubt. But I feel like this kind of thing's been done in other languages, whether it be English or Swedish or other Japanese filmmakers since. So yeah, you cut back to 53. If I was alive then, I might have been bowled over by this movie, like I guess a lot of the American filmmakers, directors and so on, who saw it. Maybe Marty Scorsese or Coppola, whoever, the ones that had the power. Hopper apparently is a huge fan of foreign cinema to bring this into America during the new wave in the early 70s. Maybe that's why it even happened. But I guess that's maybe my issue with this. It feels like it's been done by the people a lot of times since. It's like you watching Frankenstein. You didn't respect what's going on there as much as I did. I respected well, it. Well, you didn't like it as much as didn't I like did. It as much, yeah. Because it's been done. That literal story has been done yeah. so many times yeah. since, for one thing. This one's not quite like that. But I guess that's maybe part of it. And I do respect the notion that they all, especially the parents, but even the middle-aged people, if they're middle-aged, basically our age people, do it a lot too, which is the Grin and Barrett style that is probably common to the Far East, to Japan, especially, I guess, but maybe all the other cultures that are in that area, Thailand, Cambodia, Chinese, whatever, I don't really know, Koreans. But it just feels like they're suffering in silence, although we all do that, I guess. Canadians do that more than probably Americans do as well. We can relate to this in some ways. But I guess I just feel like I've seen other movies do this kind of thing better, or as well at least, and it didn't take two hours and 16 minutes to do it. <laughs> the pace, it's Ozu. That's how he shoots it, just like the static shots, the, what's it called, tatami mat shots, because it's almost always on the ground. People sit on the ground constantly. Yeah, it's like the point of view of somebody who's sitting cross-legged on the ground but even being a deli- place. But even having a deliberate pace, this thing is so slow. I disagree. He's making the choice to let shots go on and on and on. He's a filmmaker who breaks the rules. I think that's probably part of the reason why so many directors love him. He doesn't follow the rules. He does his own thing, and he makes it really work. And, and you I know it's his still, film when you're watching it. Yes, you definitely know he's an auteur, but I think he makes his own rules, and he makes these, in my opinion, incredibly effective films. This film really works on me. The pacing of the shots is long. We show banal nothing sequences with no cutting to save time to keep the film moving. It's called the transcendental style. This is a term that was coined by Paul Schrader, who is a huge fan of Ozu as well. And he used it to describe any style of filmmaking that withholds from viewers in order to increase the impact later in the film. This film doesn't do anything to manipulate our emotions. It doesn't have... It sure doesn't. No, it sure doesn't, right. It doesn't swell the music. It doesn't have melodramatic dialogue. The camera doesn't even move. There's only, I think, one or two shots where the camera moves at all. So you're never going to get that slow push-in shot. You don't get these beautiful monologues with the actors, and the actors are performing this really controlled and deliberate style, and there's something calm and almost dreamlike and certainly deliberately slow. I am not bored by the movie, I think, because each and every single frame of this film is like a painting. He's big on frames within frames, too. Yeah, yeah. The composition is so beautiful. It's so intentional and precise. And I could just study the frame. And it's amazing because he uses the same camera shot every single time. He's not getting creative with the way he places his camera. Mm. It's all about the mise-en-scene. The set is very deliberately built and objects are placed in the frame with incredible intention. So you have the very traditional homes with the tatami mats and the sliding doors. These are very traditionally Japanese homes, but then you have modern items. They have the paper fans, but then you have an electric fan and they're all juxtaposed with each other to give the impression of these two worlds colliding. And that's part of what's causing the conflict between the kids and the parents, although it's pretty universal. Other films obviously deal with it, but I think they usually lead up to either... A screaming match. Or a catharsis. You either get the screaming match and the catharsis through somebody rejecting their bad parent and it being really black and white and saying, well, there is a toxic relationship here and somebody frees himself from the toxic relationship. Or you have... Or they reconcile. Or they reconcile. You have have like a difficulty and there's a big fight, but then, oh, but we loved each other all along. And in the end, that closeness is returned. But who do you know who has a relationship like that with their parents? Anything remotely like that? We know a couple people, I suppose, that are pretty close with their parents, but look at our own relationship with our parents. I can talk bad about my parents in this podcast because I don't think they've ever listened to a single episode of got, this podcast. They've got the time. They've got the 
the time, they show next to no interest. They never in ask this. us about it. No, no. I think it's honestly been years since they have asked us about the podcast. And that goes for your parents, too. I'm including them. Now, we love our parents. The kids in this movie can kind of seem like villains until I you're don't like, agree. because I am them. If our parents came and visited us here, it would be the biggest pain in my ass. To stay over, yeah. Spend the night. If we had to accommodate them in our little house, we live in Toronto. We have a very small house. Your mom spent one night here or there. It's not a big mm. deal. But it is actually a bit of an ordeal. Mm -hmm. And if they just came to stay and I had to entertain them and feed them and find place for them and deal with arguing with my own kids and making time and mixing up my schedule, paying for food, they make a big stink about how they have to buy meat. They can't afford fish for sashimi and yeah. all these things they have to do to accommodate them. My dad and my stepmom in particular react like they do. They can be really polite and standoffish and everything is... But they're quietly judging us. But they're quietly judging us. <laughs> but they will never make a stink. And they will just sit there and politely watch us and silently judge us. And I was raised by a man who drank too much. An alcoholic. Oh, yeah, that's right. Which is what Shukichi, because that's the dad's name, in this was. Look how Shige, Shige responds when he comes to her salon with his friends and they're all blitzed. She has a right to be frustrated about that, but this is about, you used to do this, and you're doing this again. Mm -hmm. That's maybe what she literally says. But meanwhile, he's so tightly wound up in the whole movie, and that night out drinking with his friends is the only time he seems to... He rags on his kids. Out. He rags on they're his They're disappointed kids. to him. But they're ragging on him and his wife, That's why too. they politely hate each other. Yeah, yeah, like they said. politely hate each other. It's amazing how you can have this relationship with someone in your life, and there can be so much distance and difficulty when you're grown. And I brought this up before with you lots of times. Would you hang out with, be friends with, do things with people in your family if they weren't your family? Would you hang out with your dad, with your mom, with your sisters or brothers, with your cousins, with your aunts and your uncles? None of those people will listen to this podcast probably either, but there aren't that many people in my family I would choose to hang out with. And maybe they feel the same way in return about me. But we said with our parents, all five of them, with your stepmom included, would we choose to hang out with yeah. any of them? If we were co-workers, would we be friends? Would we go you out You might be with your work? stepmom ironically, and maybe it's because she didn't raise me. I get along with her very well. Mm. We really can hit it off. And my sister and I are very close. Right. So there's one yeah. person. Yeah. But I think a lot of people when they watch this movie get mad at the kids, the five of them. Not so much Kyoko, obviously. She's the one that still lives with them. She's a school teacher where they live near Hiroshima. But you said it already. What exactly are they supposed to do? I guess they know the parents are coming. It's not like it's a surprise visit. But they don't have a lot of space. They don't have a lot of time. And it seems like they don't really want to be around them. I mentioned watching Late Spring not that long ago, within the last five months, I guess I saw it. I didn't love that movie either. I'm not a huge Ozu guy. I know that Ebert raved about Floating Weeds, which I know I saw a long time ago. I don't remember it at all. I'm sure it was at least a good movie, but not really my cup of tea. But Late Spring has some of the same themes, and it's about half an hour shorter. It's got two of the same actors from this and two of the key roles. So the top three actors in this are Chishu Ryu. So he is Shukichi, the dad. Chieko Higashiyama, she's the mom, that's Tomi, Tommy, the one that dies. And Setsuko Hara is Noriko, the daughter-in-law. In that movie, Hara is Ryu's daughter, his actual daughter, and it has a beautiful ending, but similar to this ending. And I do like the ending of this, by the way. The last 20 or 30 minutes has more interesting things going on. And I guess part of the point of this movie, and I don't remember this being quite the same in Late Spring, it was probably very similar in Late Spring, is the quiet desperation type aspect. And these people are boring. As hell. <laughs> I talked about the scintillating dialogue. This movie does not have scintillating dialogue at all. Yeah, yeah. We talked about a camera that doesn't move. Well, that's Kevin Smith. It's always been the shot at him. And the biggest contrast between these two people, Ozu and Smith, apart from crassness with Smith and his obsession with poop jokes and whatnot, would probably be that Smith writes great dialogue, the thing he does best. I guess this is intentional, but this dialogue is so... So. Oh, it's the most painful, banal, small and talk. And I guess that's the point. But this persistent, exaggerated politeness is its own form of tension. You can feel the tension building as the movie goes on. Absolutely no one will say what they're really thinking or feeling. And each character has this placid smile of pasted on their face at all times, no yep. matter what is happening, until the final act when their placidity... Is that a word? <laughs> the placidness through the first 90 minutes of the film and that building tension makes the emotional hit when Tomi dies and they're gathered around her body and they're having the funeral and they all kind of fall apart in their own ways. And the emotion is so strong after all of that repression that it breaks me emotionally. And both times I've seen this movie, it has really stayed with me. And like, maybe this is a cultural thing and maybe this is something that 70 years ago 
but they still don't hug each other. No. One, the mother, the wife, the grandmother, in the case of little kids. Although those kids have tantrums when they aren't able to go out. Their dad's at work. They're expressing their emotions, they're right? Expressing. <laughs> and they're expressing their emotions. The children are expressing their emotions. And Kyoko is a little more expressive as well. It's like the older people get, the yeah, more right. concrete they become. And look at Tomi. She's dying. and she's Still smiling. Still smiling. Plus a smile. And then her husband, she's dead, and he just can't seem to make a facial expression. He'll stare off into the middle distance like he's in a total trance. Mm. And people are checking on him, and they're like, I guess you're going to be lonely now. He's like, yep, I guess I am. Mm. <laughs> well, their lives changed, or his life changed that much, because I don't think they talked all that much anyway. And we already said our parents don't listen to this. Not that my mom would be shocked to hear this, because and my dad must realize this, but she said that when he was in the hospital for a little while... Her life didn't change that much because he didn't say that much to her anyway. Your dad does not talk very much at all. And I think that's what's going to happen with Shuchichi because did he really talk to her that much anyway? But they did seem to like each other. Okay. I think the spouses in this movie seem to like each other fine. And the loneliest character in the film is Mariko. Mariko. You talk about this placid smile. Her smile isn't even placid anymore. It's like a mask. She has this pain. She wears it so aggressively cheerful and agreeable all the time. And there's this grimace on her face that's baked into that smile. Such a great performance. Because her husband's missing in action. Her husband was missing in action. He's been gone for eight years. So there's the loneliness of her being this kind of widow in limbo. Then the guilt that she confesses to later. She doesn't really think about him all that much. Mm. They weren't married for very long when he went away. He was a little fraction, this little sliver of her entire life that kind of defines the way she lives now on her own as a single woman working. Work is also a really big part of this movie. Mm -hmm. So many movies would just make passing reference to people's jobs, but they have endless free time and money as they always right. do in movies. But instead, we really see these people working. They have to make arrangements with their job. Noriko does have to make arrangements with her boss to get the day off so she can take them out, mm -hmm. which are arrangements that their actual children will not make. One's a doctor, I get how that's a demanding job, and the other one runs her own business. But that's also the theme of the post-war economics then. They were westernizing. Japan is a very hard-working society. You look at the way America operates in this mercilessly grind culture. I think Japan is worse and has been for a very long time. It's baked in their culture. You just work yourself to death. So what do you do then when your retired parents come loafing around and demanding your time? There's got to be a, a level of resentment when you're already working that hard. And Another thing I can know relate this. to. This is our culture. Yes. Parents, <laughs> yeah. you know this. <laughs> we get a fair amount of vacation, you and I, and I can still feel like <laughs> I'm always chasing a car downhill trying yeah. to keep up with life. Yeah, it's true. We don't have any kids to deal with either. Yeah, yeah. And we have to go to our parents almost always. They're not coming to us. Just to finish my point about Noriko, she's the only one that makes time for Shukichi and Tomi. Yeah, and at the end, he's saying to her that you're better than my kids. You've did you done treat more me for better, me at least. than treat my us kids better. have. And that's when she confesses her guilt. Nothing is good enough. Why do you think she never remarried in eight years? Was she actually waiting for permission? Maybe she didn't love her husband, their son, anyway. Yeah. Marriages so often then in every culture were more arranged than they are now. They never say anything about this in the movie, but I also wonder if Japan at that time... There were probably way less young men than young women. They died in the war. So many of them died in the war. So it might just be a case of there's no men for her to marry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she says she's lonely. I think she wants to be with somebody, but I don't think she's dying to be either. But then Tommy does encourage her to remarry the last time they see each other. That's one of the storylines in Late Spring. Hara's character playing Ryu's actual daughter. Everyone's saying she should get married. She should get married. She should get married. I won't give away what happens at the end. But I will say, if you haven't seen Late Spring... Okay, I'll just put it this way. The ending is similar. And those two characters have an important conversation in both movies, but they're playing different types of people. Actually, it's very similar characters, though, because it is a father and a daughter relationship in one movie and a daughter-in-law in this case. So he stole from himself. Late Spring did come before. It was 1948. But Noriko also has a conversation with Kyoko in the parents' home after the funerals happen because the youngest daughter resents her siblings for how they do treat the parents, which is not that bad in the first place. But this is, and you pointed this out earlier, the kids, so her nephews, and then herself being younger than her brothers and sisters. Maybe it's just a matter of they're more emotional in Japan as they get younger. They're more like North Americans would be then and certainly are now. They're allowed to show more emotion because nobody really rags anybody outwardly unless they have alcohol in them. Well, okay, and then her brother and sister do in a way, but it's still more repressed than what she's saying to her sister-in-law, which is 
I don't like them. They wanted something They're from selfish. my mother. But then again, she's going back on an eight-hour train ride. She wants something that belonged to her mother, a kimono or something like that. A well, scarf, yeah. Okay, she wants a scarf. She can't wait days to get it if they're going to leave right away. I didn't really understand the youngest daughter being mad about that. When's she going to get the scarf? Because she was cheerful about it. She's like, oh, I always love that scarf. I'm going to take that scarf instead of, I need something to remember mother by. She just wasn't plaintive enough okay. about losing her mother. You should never judge how somebody grieves somebody. And they tell her not to judge. That is the message of the film because Noriko says, no, you don't understand. When you are her age, you'll be like this too. It's funny because Noriko is the one who is making time for her in-laws. They aren't even her parents. Yet she calls herself selfish. And she calls herself selfish. But she isn't. Yeah. yeah. Not so, compared to everybody and else. she's the one who's like, you need to forgive your brother and sister. You are going to be in their place too. You're young. Your childhood is still really fresh in your memory. You just haven't separated yourself from your parents yet. But when you get married and once you have kids, you'll realize that life truly moves on. Two things in this movie. Well, there's several great themes in it, but life carries on is a big thing. There's uh, lots of dee, traveling, uh, da, lots of traveling around. motifs. You see kids walking to school. You see boats. You see lots of train motifs. The second last shot in the film is Shukichi staring out the window, mm. sad and alone, sitting in his grief. And then the very last shot of the movie is a wide shot again of the town. They use all these beautiful interstitial shots, mm. incidentally, of just life around them that aren't necessarily connected to the story, but just give you a time and place. So it's one of those shots, and it's the town, and there's a boat in the distance, and it's just life carrying on. His life has kind of ended in a way. He's in the next phase of his widowhood, and probably the quality of his life is going to go down. He's going to be lonelier. He'll never be that happy again. But the world doesn't care. He's thinking about getting drunk. He very well may be. I really don't know what would stop him, honestly, at Mm. that point. Because... The main theme of the film, and they say this right out loud, life is disappointing. With a smile on her face, life sure is disappointing. Mm -hmm. And then the Rico's response, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. With that oppressive, aggressive cheer that they say everything. But a culture that had bombs dropped on them not even a decade earlier. No other country ever had to deal with that. No other country had to deal with bombs dropped on them? I mean, the nuclear bombs (laughs) we're talking about. Oh, nuclear bombs. The cities that didn't get nuked got firebombed. Tokyo apparently was destroyed much worse Mm. than Hiroshima or Nagasaki because the firebombs were devastating. When this film takes place and they're taking the tour of Tokyo, they're taking a tour of a city that was basically brand new because everything had to be rebuilt. And that's part of where the industry comes from and where everybody's moving on and westernizing. Busy, busy, busy. Well, look at that great gag in Back to the Future when they're looking at the parts for the DeLorean and the 1955 doc says to Marty, no wonder it broke, it's made in Japan. What are you talking about, doc? (laughs) All the best stuff's made there now. That's 40 years after the war and 30 years after the time frame of when this movie is set. And yeah, something made in Japan in 1953, 1955, you'd probably think it would be crap. And why is this in an expensive car? But in the 80s, of course it would be. And I guess that's probably still true now. All right, so name pronunciation. I think I already got his name wrong a few minutes ago. His character's name, that is. Shu Kichi. I think I was saying Shu Chichi. Sorry. Anyway, Shishu Ryu had about 300 credits on the IMDb, so he worked a lot. He is the dad in Late Spring and also is in Akira Kurosawa's, I think, last film, or certainly one of his last films, Dreams, which I have not seen. I've seen most of Kurosawa, but not that. Chieko Higashiyama, Higashiyama, I think I got that right, was in Ozu's Early Summer and Kurosawa's The Idiot. Oh, I haven't seen that either. That's two I haven't seen from Kurosawa. Satsuko Hara, I saw already in late spring, and then also in Ozu's late autumn. Haruko Sugimura, or maybe it's Sugimura, was in early summer, Floating Weeds, and Red Beard, which I believe was a Kurosawa film. I may not have seen that one either. Hmm, maybe that's three I have thought of right here. <laughs> Why are you admitting to all this? <laughs> well, I like to be honest, I'm pushing glasses back on my own head about myself. So Yamamura, well, actually, was in Tora 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 and Gung Ho. So we're talking about more well known. Well, I guess Tora 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 was... Well, it was made by Fox, so I guess maybe it was a movie about Japanese people, but made by America. And Gung Ho is the Ron Howard movie with Michael Keaton. Kyoko Kagawa, who plays Kyoko, was in High and Low for Kurosawa, and Sancho the Bailiff, a pretty well-known film, which is also on the sight and sound list. I think many times it's been including this most recent one. Ozu, directed, I mentioned a lot of these titles, Late Spring, Early Summer, and Floating Weeds. We talked about his style already, the repression, the slow pace, frames within frames. That's a big theme with him and I think all of his movies, and I do like that a lot. He wrote the movie with Kogo Noda, who also wrote Late Spring with Ozu and other Ozu films for that matter. And Takeshi Yamamoto produced it. He produced Late Spring and other Ozu films. The film is 1371. We saw it on Canopy. 
The cinematographer Yaharu Atsuta shot other ozus, such as An Autumn Afternoon, and the editor Yoshiyasu Hamamura cut many other ozu films. The composer, nice gentle score on this, a good score. Takanobu Saito, it was his debut. He also composed for Floating Weeds, and he did other ozu films on top of that. So what do you think about the writing, the directing, the producing, and all those stylistic notes? Well, a lot of his cast and his crew worked with him over and over and over again. He gets all the credit, but this is kind of a team of people who work together consistently. Wes Anderson talks about how everybody gives him all this credit, but he actually has these really talented production designers that do all the work for them. And in many ways, that's their taste that's finding its way into his film, but then it becomes a Wes Andersonism. So who knows when you watch an Ozu film, how many choices were made by the production designer, by the cinematographer, certainly by the editor. This is a really distinct style of editing. Other films, even by the 50s, would never have lingered on shots as long as this film does and it creates a feel that maybe we can credit the editor with. And it's more of a collaboration and more of a team of artists working together to create these really similar films that are also really high quality. And I have nothing but admiration for everything they do in this movie. You're right. Filmmaking teams are important. Spielberg uses the same people over and over again for decades. Scorsese generally does. It's an incredibly collaborative art form directors deserve credit for steering the ship for sure but there's just so many little decisions that are made by the actors by the costume designers by the cinematographers and editors Mm. because of the expertise and the taste that they bring to the project and knowing what their director wants because they've Mm. done it before probably they have a shorthand i'm sure all these people working together what happens next we already covered i think most of my points i have here but the man discovers that even though his wife is gone his life hasn't changed that much i think he's gonna start drinking a lot more often now And his kids go back to living their self-involved lives, especially the two. Well, Kaizo missed the funeral. And I was reading somewhere about how, oh, how could he? He was busy and he couldn't get there. I think he tried to. What are you going to do? We just are hours away from having seen Bo is Afraid, a very existential movie. But whatever's real in that movie, and maybe not very much of it is, his whole drive in the film is to get to his mother after she's... Something's happened to her. I won't give it away what happens to her. His drive is to get to see her. And he's delayed and delayed and delayed by very unusual and weird things. And maybe it's entirely a fantasy. Well, I think the same thing might have been happening here with Kaizo. He was busy. He was trying to get there and couldn't get there in time. He missed the funeral. This happens. Life happens. What does he say? If I had taken this train instead of that train, I would have made it in time. But how does he know? And the truth is, this is just realistic. Lots of times people don't make it in time. We've all heard the story of the person who's like, they died almost exactly the moment my plane hit the tarmac. If I had taken the earlier flight, we would have made it in time. And then some people say, well, they died then because they were waiting for us. So that's why we all made it in time because they were waiting to die. And then other people are like, well, they died before we got there because they didn't want us to see them that way. We ascribe all kinds of meaning to things because it's always going to be messy because life is messy because life is disappointing. You know, you talk about Bo is Afraid is this existential movie. It's about anxiety. This is an existential movie about melancholy, about people who've been through a trauma, about people who have no expectation that their lives are going to get better, happier, that they should have real hope about the world that they live in because they've seen the horrors of war and they've seen the ways change their country and the way that they have very limited control over their lives too. So this film explores the mundanity of human suffering, but it also explores the mundanity of joy, I think. At least it pays attention to it in a small way, even though it may not be a main thing of the film. There's a scene where Tomi is asked to get out of the way. So she takes her youngest grandson who's just so little she's just watching him play in the grass and he's just tearing up grass like kids do and she has this beautiful serene expression on her face this love coming from her towards her grandson but he's in indifferent this moment he's indifferent he's not even looking at her he's turned away but she's crouching she's on his level and she's watching him and she looks so serene and happy in that moment that you can think as much as there's the mundane suffering and misery that they experience there is mundane happiness as well you might say the same about when her husband hangs out with his friends and has drinks and has fun and they get drunk and there's a camaraderie there these are things that can feel very forgettable and maybe Tommy, if she had lived another 10 years would have completely forgotten that moment maybe even like one year later would have totally forgotten that moment but those are the moments that make life worth living yeah. as much as this movie can remind you that life is suffering as well no, well, little things are the big things if you think about it, because how many huge events happen right. to any of us in films they do all the time because it's a movie or a TV show, I guess. And how much of our life is spent tidying, making awkward small talk, even with mm. people that we love, making plans, breaking plans, 
all the little things, the mundane things they do in this movie, this is what makes up life. What's become one of my favorite hobbies the last two years since we moved to this house and have a pretty great front porch is to sit on that front porch in the evening with a beverage because it's a pretty quiet street too. And sometimes we talk to our neighbors and sometimes we don't even see the neighbors. But I've really grown to love that. And also, they live a long way from their dad and they do have their own jobs and children. The train ride is... What was it? Eight hours, I saw? No, they, eight hours. no they say it's eight hours. It's not as long now, but that's because the yeah. trains are faster. But right they now. say it's overnight. That right. They have to spend the night on the train. But even a five or six hour trip, whatever it actually is now, a four hour trip, that's asking a lot. It's a long way. We complain about going an hour, hour and a half to our parents' place, partly because the traffic is so terrible. And you wonder sometimes, okay, Google Maps says it's going to be an hour and 10 minutes. Is that going to be an hour and 45 minutes? I mean, speaking of the mundanity of suffering, every moment that I have spent in Toronto traffic <laughs> It's like a moment I'll never get back, and it makes me miserable. I think you should say Southern Ontario traffic. It's just, you're right, just you're as right. Bad. There's the Golden Horseshoe. Anybody who lives around here knows what I'm talking about. Mm. But there's a few cities that are all bunched together, and driving around them is no. awful. Okay, the last thoughts on Tokyo Story. A very ordinary, boring title, actually, for this movie. But maybe that suits it, because Ozu's going for something very placid under the surface. And it's not boring. I don't want to call this movie boring. But anyway, the title's not exactly scintillating. Your last thoughts on it. Sounds like it's not really for you necessarily. It is much more up my alley. I think it's an outstanding work of art. And I think that if you're listening and you tend to agree with Ryan, this is a film that you struggled with, I really recommend giving it another viewing. I got way more out of it this second time around. I really believe it deserves your attention, especially if you love cinema. Well, I do. Cinema. This is a great example of a classic movie that I respect, but it being as revered as it is escapes me. I've seen this twice. And that's enough. I'd sooner check out Late Spring again, which has some of the same themes, especially with the Setsuko Hara arc. And it isn't two hours and 16 minutes long. <laughs> it is a total shame that we covered this movie after we covered In the Mood for Love, a film that I realize now was tremendously influenced by Ozu. Yeah. There are so many things in that film that could have been straight stolen from Tokyo Story and Ozu's other films, and probably lots of other films that are really heavily influenced by him. Good point. And it's also possible that in all these cases with these movies that were made in other languages, they're saying things that might be more fascinating to people if they understand what they're actually saying rather than relying on subtitles. But at least in this case, we didn't watch it off YouTube or something, which might have had terrible subtitles. This was the Criterion print on Canopy. I'm sure that's what you got if you saw the Blu-ray, and that's as good as you're going to get. So whatever we were reading is what's supposed to be there in English, but maybe the translation still, no matter how hard people work, is not quite accurate. It probably isn't quite accurate. Some things simply don't translate. Yeah. That was Tokyo Story. In seven days, we'll keep laughing. Okay, we'll start laughing. As we cover Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau in one of their signature flicks, the 1968 Move In With Your Buddy and Find Out Just How Close You Aren't comedy, The Odd Couple. <laughs> the coming attractions trivia for The Odd Couple. What a left turn this is from the movie we just talked about. Although, people that don't like each other very much. There you go. <laughs> they're just more expressive about it. A lot more expressive about it. Good okay, segue. The, Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau were in 10 films together, and Lemmon also directed Matthau and Koch. I think that was the only movie Lemmon ever directed as well. We've never covered one of their collaborations before now, though. What was the first film they made together, and what was the last film they made together? Again, not the greatest trivia in the world, but I couldn't think of anything better. <laughs> I haven't seen The Odd Couple in a long time. Couldn't think of anything better. All right, so for the answer to that question, check out next week's podcast about The Odd Couple. You obviously already know how to find us, but let me remind you to favorite or subscribe wherever you listen. You can also find us on YouTube now. We are at H-Y-E-S Ellis. All of our recent podcasts are there, along with the occasional bit of bonus material for you guys. <laughs> We're both on Twitter. I'm at Bev Ellis Ellis, and Ryan is at MovieFiend51. Or you can reach us by email, have you ever seen podcast at gmail.com. And to enjoy freshly roasted premium coffee delivered straight to you in Canada or the U.S., please go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S and enjoy a 20% discount. You will not be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Sayonara. Sayonara. And cut.